when we do things our own way for the sake of our own puny little kingdoms and it backfires, what do we got to do to get back on track? How do we move forward in things like our marriage or in parenting or in faith or, or in our relationships or at work? How do we get back into routines of faithfulness and obedience? Like what should rebuilt integrity look like? Every day of your life, of my life, we all come before God needy and broken all the time. And that's one of my favorite descriptions of our faith is that it's like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And so here's the question that we're going to broach today. What does it look like to obey after you've disobeyed? I wish I could describe how important this was for your entire Christian walk. What does it look like to obey after you've disobeyed? And yes, hey, yes, the content of the disobedience might be a little different. But we still have to think about what ongoing faithfulness looks like after we botch it, after we fall short. Listen, please get it. In God's hands, we believe that we are not defined by the worst thing that we've ever done. Amen, we all say. But then you gotta go, well, what does that actually look like in the practical? Like when we mess up, how do we get back on track? And thankfully, we're not in the dark. Holy Scripture will help us out with this in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's gonna help us get an answer to our question And here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to rush to just some abstract principles to answer that question. Rather, I want us to wade a little more gradually into this story. And in doing so, I believe that the contours of obedience and disobedience will be more clearly seen if we patiently go through this story once again. I think we'll have a fuller vision of of an answer to our question. So let's do a slower read through of this with obedience now as our interpretive key. Verse one, look at verse one. In the spring of year, when kings go to battle, last line of verse one, David stayed in Jerusalem. So the end of verse one, our guy's already disobeying. And if we're reading David's story rightly, he's been growing in grace like we've talked about for the past couple of weeks. A lot more military victories, a lot more justice and peace for the people. Like he's growing in who he is and who God's called him to be and what God's called him to do. So look, I don't think it's wrong to read verse one with that kind of momentum that we've been talking about. And if verse one is about disobedience and the momentum is all about grace, then guess what that means? It means that disobedience always presumes on grace. Disobedience always presumes on grace. How do I know that? This is what David thought. (laughs) Dude, they don't need me out of war. You know why? I'm on a winning streak, baby. I don't need me. I'm good. I'm unstoppable. Have you read the last five chapters? You can't touch this, right? So I'm just going to stay in Jerusalem. I'm just going to stay here. It's okay. It's fine. Well, I mean, yes, it's, it's all God, of course. Praise the Lord, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, they don't need me. I'm going to stay here. And friends, I will tell you right now, when you think you are entitled to grace, you're not thinking about grace anymore. That's something different. Presumption kills obedience. So what does David do with all his newly found free time? Well, he takes a walk on his massive palace roof porch out there, the center of the city, and he sees a woman bathing. And the original language of verse two, it says that she was pleasing to the eyes, pleasing to the eyes. Now go all the way down to verse 27 in your chapter. Look at verse 27. Last line of the whole chapter, verse 27. It says, the thing displeased Yahweh. And the Hebrew of that last line is that it was not pleasing in the eyes of Yahweh. And so this whole episode begins and ends the same way with what is pleasing to the eyes. And what I'm telling you is that, you know what that means? That God is not in this. In fact, you ready for this? Go ahead and read the rest of 1, 2 Samuel. You know what you'll find? God everywhere. The only time God is mentioned in this whole chapter is the last word of the whole chapter. And this means that true obedience is when God is your primary reference point and standard. That is true, true north obedience. And that also means that disobedience is when you start to dilute God's standards and desires with your own standards and desires. That is what is slowly happening here like a patient leaky faucet. So what does David do? Verse 4. He tells his servants to bring her to him, and then he sleeps with her, and then she gets pregnant. And here's where I want to pause just for a second. Um, If you're looking at verses two through five in your Bible, which we just covered, you know that there's a lot of details that are left out. Some of them you're like, how in the world did it happen? Some of it is probably good that we don't have it. But I tell you this right now, in and around and through and above all those details, just for a second, um, 
if you have ever found yourself in Bathsheba's place, like if you have ever felt forced or coerced or preyed upon into sexual behavior, please hear me clearly. It is not okay. It is sin. It is evil. Even if you're telling yourself a different story, it is not God's design. It is evil. And if that's your experience, my heart aches and breaks for you. Seriously, brother or sister, if that's been part of your story, I'm so, so sorry. And if that's something that you need to process and work through continually, um, we have incredible godly staff that can talk to you. We have a partnership with incredible godly licensed therapists in the area we'd love to connect you with. And so if that's the case, we'd love to, to help you help you out there. But for David here, what we need to do is we need to start to recognize a progression. David, remember, he saw something that was good to the eyes and he took it. That's a slight progression. And guess what that is? That's Adam and Eve. That's in Genesis. They saw that the fruit was good to the eyes and they took it from the tree, both falling from royalty. But there's another progression here. And here's how I know there's a progression. Because none of us thinks anything bad about verse one if we just have verse one. Dude, so what? He stayed in Jerusalem. Chill out, Thompson. <laughs> you just stay. He's war, Jerusalem. You just stayed in Jerusalem. No big deal, no big sin. <laughs> but that's the snowball at the top of the hill. Because you know what happens next? Then he looks at her in lust. And we aren't told, but maybe he ends up like doing this triangulated deception with his servants. Like, what does he say to the servants to go get her? I don't know. We're not told. But perhaps there's triangulated deception there and why he needs Bathsheba to be brought to him. And then he sleeps with her and now it's way more than a snowball and it's gaining speed. And we know he's getting ready to have her husband executed. And by the time that happens, it is an absolute avalanche. And here's the scary point. Disobedience in the small things leads to disobedience in the big things. That's what's happening right here, right before our eyes. You might not think it's not that big of a deal, but disobedience in the small things leads to disobedience in the big things. Here's the deal. He could have seen her naked, walk, taking a little walk on his, on his roof palace uh, overlook thing there. He could have seen her naked, lusted, gone inside and went, Mephibosheth, bro, sit down. I, we got to talk, dude. I need to confess some sin to you, man. I got to. He could have done that. <clears throat> that would have not been hard. He could have done that, but he didn't. He could have done that. You know why? Because things like confession and repentance stop it from becoming an avalanche. But alas, David did not. And I tell you right now, if you do not stop disobedience, you feed it. But again, David doesn't confess. Instead, <clears throat> what does he do? <clears throat> you get two, two options at this juncture. Fork in the road. You get two options. Confess or cover it up. David covers it up and his version of fig leaves is ugly. Big time ugly. He sends a messenger to Joab, the army commander, and he tells him to send Uriah home, send Bathsheba's husband home. And obviously the logic here is what guy coming home from war doesn't want to go see his wife and sleep with his wife. And then when she has a baby, David can be like, hey, way to go, baby's early. Like that's, that's the plan. David can do that. But his plan mega backfires and Uriah, oh man, he sleeps on David's front porch right outside the palace instead of go home to, go home to his own house and, and his own wife. And when David asks him about it, listen to Uriah's response. The deep and painful irony of this response is unbelievable. So David's asking Uriah, bro, why didn't you go home last night? <clears throat> verse 11, look at what Uriah says. Verse 11, look. Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Dude, you have to feel the absolute sting and irony of this. Dude, aside from the fact that Uriah, look, Uriah the Hittite, he's a Hittite. He's not even from, descended from Father Abraham. He's a Gentile no name. And here he is being more faithful and more obedient than King David, the guy whose name is mentioned more than anybody else in the whole Bible. And so you know what David thinks? He doesn't say it, but this is what he thinks. He goes, all right, you want to go, little man? We're going to see how noble you are when you're absolutely hammered drunk. And so the next day David goes, hey, man, come on to supper, buddy, and keeps shoving him glasses of wine, and he gets Uriah drunk, and Uriah is still noble while he's drunk, and he doesn't go down <clears throat> to his own house and shockingly and unbelievably, this leads David to confess, 
cover it up. It leads David to a murder plot. Why? Because disobedience justifies the unthinkable. Disobedience normalizes extremity. It accommodates evil. That's what disobedience does. So David sends Uriah back to Joab and to war. And David sends a letter with him that guarantees his own death. So there goes Uriah, scroll in hand, letter from the king. And guess what? It is instructions for his own execution. And the instructions are to put Uriah at the front of the hardest fighting and then back away so he'll die. And sure enough, Joab sends messengers to David and they say to him, look at the end of verse 24, last line in verse 24. They say to him, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. In fact, it's also the last line in verse 21. Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And when something's repeated in the Bible, we should pay attention to it. Get this. The narrator doesn't call Uriah David's servant because after all, he's the king and every single little minion warrior person is actually his servant. No, 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 no. This is satire and painful sarcasm and irony because in a dark and twisted way, Uriah was a servant to David's sinister plans. And he weirdly and kind of in a fleeting way is more like Christ. He's the innocent and obedient one who was led away to death. There is one final way to think about our big question. How do you obey after you disobey? And it actually comes in 2 Samuel chapter 12, right there, the next chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And for the sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. The narrator right here wants you to think about King Saul. When he made a big mistake, it goes a little something like this. Just like King Saul had prophet Samuel to call him out on his business after his downfall, so King David has prophet Nathan. And Nathan comes to David in chapter 12 and says, Dave, sit down, be quiet, I gotta tell you a story. It goes a little something like this. Look up here, don't read it. <clears throat> Here's my paraphrase because it's fun. David, there was a small town on the interstate and on one side of the interstate there was a guy who owned tons of of land and cattle and sheep and servants and hotels and horses and et cetera, et cetera. And he had everything that anybody in that small town could ever want. And his name was Mr. Big Deal. And on the other side of the interstate, there lived a poor man in a trailer who didn't have much to call his own at all, but he had the sweetest, cutest little lamb that kept him company. And it was so cuddly and it would snuggle in his bed with him every night. Nobody even really knew this guy's name. And David, one day a traveler pulled off the interstate and stopped at one of the hotels owned by Mr. Big Deal. And the traveler asked if he could have some lamb stew for supper. And Mr. Big Deal said, absolutely, give me two hours. And Mr. Big Deal marched right across the interstate and snatched the lamb from the poor man's arms and went and made lamb stew for the traveler. And when Nathan finishes this story, David loses his mind. Look at chapter 12, verse five. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. Stop. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think anger greatly kindled. It's probably like, oh darn, that's not it. So David is yelling and cussing in Hebrew, like, who does this guy think he is? What an absolute jerk. Where does he get off? How dare he? Somebody needs to put a spear through that guy right now. He deserves to die. That's what it says. Look, that's what it says. David's yelling, losing his mind. And then after a few minutes, David's anger starts to slightly wane and he sits back down and Nathan puts his hand on David's shoulder and looks directly into his eyes and says quietly, David, David. You are that man. I tell you the truth, that anybody who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her. Now, yes, Nathan goes on to talk to David about the repercussions and the consequences for his sin. But prophet Nathan also does something here that actually kind of bothers me a little bit. I want you to see it for yourself. You can go read the rest of the stuff later, but look down in chapter 12, verse 13. Look at verse 13. David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Pause. Again, the narrator wants us to think back to Saul. When prophet Samuel 
came to King Saul when he messed it up, messed up big time in 1 Samuel 15. You remember what Saul says? Anybody remember what Saul says? He goes, oh, oh, yeah, uh, the people made me do it. It was their fault. They did it. He does the blame thing. And so on one level, we, David's different. He is different. He actually kind of owns it. He says, I have sinned against Yahweh. And here's the thing that Nathan does that actually kind of bothers me. Look at the last half of verse 13. Look, Nathan goes, you're forgiven. Wait, what? Nate, hey, Nathan, <laughs> excuse me, sir. You got a permit for that? Like forgiven, forgiven? How, how, Nathan, you just can't go pronouncing absolution just like that. Like no, who gives you the right, Nathan, to be like, yes, God has put away your sin. You are forgiven, forgiven. Nathan knows and he remembers something that David has all but forgotten. The grace that David presumed upon throughout all of chapter 11, Nathan has not forgotten. Back in chapter seven, Yahweh made unbreakable covenant promises to David. God unconditionally committed himself to David and to David's family. And that's all about grace. And how do I know that it's all about grace? Because about an hour or two after this conversation with Nathan, David goes away and he opens up his prayer journal and he begins to weep and he starts to write and pray. And that prayer that he sat down to write became a song and we call it Psalm 51. And it starts like this. Be gracious to me, oh God. Be gracious to me according to your loving kindness. Have compassion on me according to your steadfast love. That's how I know it's all about grace. And this is the ultimate way that we learn to obey after we've disobeyed. We have to call to mind every day that the rock solid foundation of our relationship with God is not our performance, but his unfailing love and grace. That is rock solid foundation of it. It is grace and not our track record that is ground zero before God. In fact, hey, in God's family, your achievements and your accolades and your trophies and your good deeds aren't the most significant thing about you. And conversely, in God's family, your absolute worst failures and sins and wrongdoings aren't the things that define you the most. Rather, you are a part of his family by grace and will be sustained by grace if you're trusting him alone for real and eternal life. And the fact that you are his is the most important and the truest thing about you. And when we remember this grace, it's not just that past disobedience is wiped clean. This grace is also meant to empower future obedience and future faithfulness. And dude, I love this so, so much. Anybody know the first line in the entire New Testament? It goes a little something like this. This is a story about Jesus, the son of David. That's the first line in the entire New Testament because Jesus is the final fulfillment of everything that God promised to David in spite of David. Jesus is all of God's mercy and forgiveness with skin on who has come from heaven to earth to pour out endless grace for those who are thirsty. And oh man, I love how the apostle Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter two. He says that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Meaning Jesus perfectly obeyed his father, even though it cost him his life. He was willingly buried under the avalanche of sin and death that we let leak into God's good world. And in that very act of obedience at the cross, he took all of our disobedience into himself. Because of Jesus' perfect obedience in the place of our disobedience, God the Father can now look at us as though we have obeyed perfectly. If we're believing in Jesus for life and salvation, there is a very real way in which the Father sees us under the banner of his Son's perfect faithfulness. And that is now our right standing before God. And, oh, this is so good. It doesn't stop there. Jesus then gives us the Holy Spirit to now go obey in practice what we are in position before the Father. And now we can live out Jesus' perfect obedience. And this whole thing is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And it is theologically and climactically why Nathan can look at David and say, the Lord has put away your sin. Because of Jesus, we can flip the whole script. Real obedience doesn't presume, but rather cherishes grace. Real obedience has God and his gospel as its ultimate 
standard and reference point. Now obedience in the small things can lead to obedience in the big things. Real obedience doesn't justify or accommodate sin and evil. It normalizes faithfulness. And Jesus alone reverses the curse of all of this because opposite of David, Jesus saw sin, he saw that it was evil, and he took it to himself at a tree to set us free. And that changes everything. And if you don't believe me, the New Testament writers, guess what they do? They still call David a man after God's own heart. 